hey zoom people sorry i'm a little late i was just telling the folks in person that i uh, was punching up the post freudian lecture um including some videos of the folks we're going to be talking about so we could see what they were actually like and uh, now fully acknowledging that these are not the best quality videos right because these are from the 30s in some cases things along those lines uh, but at least giving us a little feel for what these people actually looks like sounded like and so just to sort of update you on the syllabus um we finished psychodynamic theory a day early so i'm just going to dive right into post freudian theory and then we will do our freud discussion day maybe elsewhere. maybe what we'll end up doing actually is just like getting through this lecture today and wednesday and then we'll have uh, Friday, Monday, and Wednesday will all be discussion days. <laughs> Just sort of put them all in a row. Um, and you'll have a lot of good background knowledge at that point so that will give you uh, all of what you need to have a really good conversation about that. So I am just going to take attendance right quick here. And I should also say your exams are graded. I did not get a chance to look at what the overall averages are. Um, here is my, I gave the, a similar pet talk to my um, intro class right before you all today. Uh, you have time. <laughs> on these right so it's it's at least 48 hours probably going to be even longer because i'll just open them up earlier in the future uh, and so give yourself that time there were not a lot but maybe like a quarter of you who just didn't do any of the short answers that's 20 points off like don't do that to yourself right give yourself time uh give yourself grace to sit down and do these and um remember it's open note open book open powerpoint right everything but open friend uh so give yourself a chance to fill everything out um, because i know there are people who failed at least portions of the exam largely because they just didn't do portions of the exam uh, but there are other people who did quite well I think the essays in general, again, if folks answered each part of each question, the grades were really good this time around, which was great. Uh, this is for my intro class. This is not going to help you guys. Um, <laughs> I will try to look at the stats for Wednesday. I just blanked on writing them down like I usually do. Um, but in general, I could tell that having the take home seemed to help folks who actually gave adequate time to it. Uh, oftentimes, this first exam is really abysmal, <laughs> to be honest, when I do it in class, so it was nice to see it not so abysmal. Uh, and again, th the vast majority of people who are answering things, getting great scores, it's just giving yourself the time to actually respond to everything. All right, so today what we're going to do is start talking about our post Freudians. Um, and like I said, I just updated this, so it's the new and improved version of this lecture. And actually, while I'm thinking about it, real quick, uh, before we dive in, I did find, and they're poor quality because these are from the 30s, but I did find uh, a few videos of Freud himself, and I thought it might be cool for y'all to see um, what he actually looked and sounded like. Where did they go? Did I not actually save them? All right. This is where YouTube can help again. All right. I think I just didn't hit save on my other computer. That's okay. Yep. Oh, there's some footage of him talking too. So I think this is the one that might be really good. This is a lot of his home movies. Grammarly makes communication at work one click simpler. Grammarly, always Grammarly. Whether you're looking. 
right, so the my father is here with a very and actually, this is kind of cool for today, Kivi, as the first post Freudian we're going to talk about is Anna Freud, and she's actually the one narrating this series of clips. So, very old friend of his who already went to school with him in Vienna. He later became an archaeologist, professor of archaeology in Rome. He used to come to Vienna once a year in the autumn and then inspected the new additions to my father's antique collection. And they stayed great friends all their lives. He was especially nice, lovable man. In this picture, neither of, two, of these two men knew that they were photographed. And that, that is why the whole thing is so natural. So yeah, Freud would hang out with, talk to a lot of folks um, intellectually. Uh, great British authors and poets came to meet him when he was in London. Um, this one is his actual speech. And again, it is really horrible quality because it was captured in the 30s. So just heads up on that. I started as a neurologist trying to break a relief to my neurotic patient. I discovered some important new facts about the unconscious, the role of instinctual urges, and so on. Out of these findings grew a new science. And so one thing I should say to just give this clip even more context is this is when Freud was in London. So he was near the end of his life and he had the jaw cancer. So he already had like the hole in his cheek and stuff like that. So that's why he sounds a little labored when he's talking. Analysis, a part of psychology as a new method of treatment of the neurosis. I had to pay heavily for this bit of good luck. People did not believe in my facts and thought my theories unsavory. <laughs> so, I mean, he fully acknowledged during his lifetime that other people didn't like what he was saying. So he, he was... Again, he was an intelligent man, right? He knew this. Uh, he knew how other people reacted to him. And as we um, go through the slides for today, I've tried to find, in some cases, I wasn't able to find clips of the person themselves, but at least finding things like um, images of them, brief videos talking about them, things along those lines. So, your text also covers objects, relations, and attachment theory. Uh, we're not going to go over that in class in detail, but there will be a couple exam questions about it, so make sure you read it. All right, so Anna Freud, Anna Freud, I've heard it said both ways. Um, so she was Freud's daughter. She was his intellectual heir, but he would never acknowledge that because he was Freud and he thought his intellectual heir should be a man. So he thought it was young and then he thought it was Adler. And I don't think he ever fully acknowledged that it was actually Anna. Um, so she was alive from 1895 to 1982. Um, and she was the only member of Freud's family to follow in his footsteps, to follow his profession. So as I mentioned previously, he was the only one who could psychoanalyze her when she was going through training. So she was psychoanalyzed by her dad. Lots of fun, I'm sure. Um, and she really was the guardian of his work and his intellectual heir. Um, she was actually sort of his physical guardian at the end of his life. She moved with him to the house in London. She actually lived with him. And I wish I would have pulled my picture uh, of her room from London because it's preserved and she had a portrait of her father above her bed. So there's a thing. Um, and again, it's probably that she was well, you know, respected. She also had a female companion. It's unclear whether this was companion in the way that 
a lot of women at the time just had like a female friend that they chose to hang out with or whether she may have had some sort of romantic relationship with her. But she never married. Um, so she really focused on children. So if you remember, Freud didn't see that many kids. Little Hans was an exception, right? Anna really focused on children. And in fact, there is in London to this day an Anna Freud Center for Children and Families in her honor. Uh, so she really wanted to look at what happens to kid kids who had beyond normal average experiences, things like war and violence. Anna was 19 at the outbreak of World War I, so that's pretty formative. World War I was to that point the bloodiest war that had ever occurred. And a lot of the fighting was on mainland Europe where she was living at the time in Vienna. Um, so she would have witnessed a lot of this. Right, <laughs> Jade, I really like your comment that it might be funny uh, about the daughter father thing. And then, you know, she may have been lesbian, who knows? She could have also been asexual, which would also poke fun holes in Freud's theories. You know, who knows? Uh, so her main contribution was taking Freud's theory and applying it to kids. She was a huge child advocate and worked throughout her life to advocate for safer conditions for children. She brought psychoanalysis into pediatrics, childcare, education, and family law. Her observations of children extended beyond normal or disturbed children growing up in average homes and included children who had met with extraordinary circumstances like war, but also physical handicaps, parentless homes. Remember before this time, therapy was really something only the wealthy could afford um, and Anna was taking it beyond that. Her observations gave people some new insight. So before Anna, it was believed that children generally had a horror of combat, blood and destruction, that war had a devastating effect on, on children. And Anna, uh, working with Dorothy Burlingham, who was another psychoanalyst, noticed that although war was upsetting to young children, their world really pivoted primarily in their family of origin, and they took a lot of cues, particularly at this time, from their mother, because mothers were generally still the primary caregivers. So I have a brief video about Anna, except for the narration she did over her father's uh, work. I can't seem to find interviews with her, which kind of tracks with her personality, where she seemed to be sort of more humble and willing to be in the background. So. Anna Freud was the daughter of the founder of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. She was born in Vienna in 1895, when her father's radical theories of sex and the mind were starting to make him famous across Europe. She became a school teacher and then a psychoanalyst, and pioneered the treatment of children, establishing clinics and nurseries for children who were war victims, survivors of the Holocaust, or just generally troubled by their lives. Perhaps most importantly for us, she is our finest guide to what we call defense mechanisms, which she described best in her 1936 book, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense. So we're gonna talk about this on the next slide. Anna is really the one who codified all of her father's defense mechanisms. She organized them, wrote them down. And so everything we talked about with defense mechanism in the Freud chapter, Anna was the one who got them organized. Freud came up with it, but she's the one who actually like wrote it down. Freud was much more obsessed with the id. Um, and, and Anna said, no, these are good ideas too. We gotta write this down. The book laid out for the first time the core idea that we instinctively try to protect our ego, our acceptable picture of who we are, with a variety of defenses. The problem is that in the act of defending ourselves against pain in the immediate term, we harm our longer term chances of dealing with reality and therefore of developing and maturing as a result. Anna Freud highlighted 10 key types of defense mechanisms. Firstly, denial. Denial is when we don't admit there is a problem. We think things like- so They're gonna choke through all the defense mechanisms here that we've already covered. But again, you saw some actual photos of her in there, which I think is really nice. Um, and these are actual photos that I have pulled as well. So this is her and her father uh, when they were in London. This is outside the London home. So Anna 
uh, made many contributions to psychodynamic theory and to the technique itself of psychoanalysis. Um, so she came up with the idea of a diagnostic profile, which was a psychoanalytic framework used to organize and integrate the information obtained during a diagnostic assessment. So she was the first one who really came up with like a formalized intake interview, basically. And it was supposed to be a complete view of personality functioning that takes into account the person's developmental level. And honestly, regardless of your orientation as a therapist, we still do this today. We all benefit from this. So this included something like reason for referral to therapy, description of, again, in Anna's case, it was usually the child, so their appearance, their moods, their manner, family background and personal history, their life story, their family makeup, possibly significant environmental influences, assessment of development. So for Anna, this was development and expression of libido and aggression, development of ego and superego. Now we would look more at like developmental stages. Um, and then genetic assessment. So they weren't doing DNA scans, but they were kind of looking at who in the family might have some psychological issues. And then also looking at signs of regression and or fixation. Uh, and they looked at dynamic and structural things. She also came up with the idea of the developmental line, which was a series of id ego interactions characterized by a shift from external controls to an increase in self control and what a lot of people refer to as ego mastery. So these lines were very psychoanalytic. So going from wetting and soiling to bladder and bowel control, for example. Uh, and they looked at things like environmental and interpersonal situations and the developmental lines complement her father's discussions of psychosexual development. As a child growing up, they progressed from dependency to emotional self-reliance, sucking to rational eating, the bedwetting and swilling to bladder and bowel control, irresponsibility to responsibility in body management specifically. The latent phase one is play to work, and then the genital phase is egocentricity to companionship. She also noted that when working with children, there are limits to environmental changes that can be made. Kids have very little control over their family, the environment they live in, right? And so she was one of the first to acknowledge you've got to work within that, right? And recognize that and not blame the child, which unfortunately other therapists sometimes did. And again, she focused on the ego and she said to understand the unconscious drives of the id, it's essential to make the ego aware of the defense mechanisms. So as that video just said, she was the one who systematized and elaborated on Freud's discussion of those ego defenses. Whereas Freud concentrated on exploring the unconscious drives of the id, his daughter realized that in order for those to emerge in analysis, the ego must become aware of what defenses are being used uh, to prevent the material from coming into consciousness. She also really emphasized observation that the ego's defenses may be inferred from observable behavior and that analysis of the defenses permits you to understand the child's life history and instinctual development. So, she would never have called herself this, but in some ways, what Anna was doing was behavioral in nature, right? And she elaborated the ego defenses outlined by her father, and she also suggested some new ones. So one of the ones she suggested is identification with the aggressor. Uh, and this is where a victor might respond to an aggressor or a captor with gratitude and admiration. Um, this is seen in prisoners of war and in hostages. We sometimes call it Stockholm syndrome. Uh, Anna was the first to articulate it. It also explains why people will stay in abusive relationships, for example. Alrighty, the next peak we're going to talk about here is Alfred Adler. So he was one of those guys that Freud thought was going to be his intellectual error, and then they got in a fight and he wasn't. Um, this happened a lot in Freud's life. So 
Uh, he was alive from 1870 to 1937, so really a contemporary of Freud. Um, he was a physician. He was actually trained as an ophthalmologist. And he joined Freud's inner circle around 1902. He was fascinated by Freud after meeting him and having discussions with him. He, again, was originally seen as potentially Freud's successor, but Adler kind of just had his own ideas. Freud didn't take too kindly to anyone kind of spitting off giant ideas of their own. Um, and of course, anyone who is an intellectual is going to come up with their own ideas, and particularly sort of ambitious young men as Freud was interacting with. So Adler was particularly interested in the idea of power. And so one of the main concepts in his theories is striving for superiority. He said that people are trying to develop a sense of mastery and understanding, and that all individuals are motivated to attain either equality with or superiority over other people. He said this was an innate striving that everyone sort of took for. This is sort of humanistic in its nature in some ways. And when we talk about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this will resonate. Um, as well. He also talked about this concept of organ inferiority. Adler believed we are all born inferior. You know, I don't know as much about Adler's backstory as some of these other folks, but it makes you kind of wonder what his childhood was like, right? Um, so what we are trying to compensate for in the striving is the fact that we are all born inferior. So Adler believed that whatever we feel in childhood is our weakest part, that we're born helpless into social and physical situations we didn't ask to be born into. And he said that everyone feels inferior as a child. And this is where the term inferiority complex comes from, is from Adler's work and people's interpretation of Adler's work. Adler also talked about the idea of masculine protest. Um, and like Freud, he called it masculine protest, but applied it equally to men and women. So take with that what you will. Um, but this was the idea of overcompensation for that inferiority. It said this is a desire of an adult to act and become more powerful because of those feelings of inadequacy or inferiority. So one of the things that Adler is tied to is the idea of the midlife crisis and particularly men going out and you know making big purchases, buying a sports car, things along those lines, right? Obviously in his time, it wasn't that, but there were other things people would do. Holistic creativity was sort of the positive side of Adler's theories. So he said people are creative, responsible individuals and they use that creativity to create themselves into the future, according to what he referred to as fictional goals, which are beliefs in which they're consciously invested. So these are our dreams, goals, plans. Yeah. Is this like self-fulfilling prophecy? A little bit, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's also like a belief in the inherent good in people and their inherent potential. Uh, but yeah, that it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you think, you know, you can do something good, you are much more likely to be able to do it, right? Yeah, and again, this just feels really humanistic to me. When we get to talking about Carl Rogers, you'll feel a lot of this in his theories. The idea that people are inherently uh, able to better themselves. But he also influenced the cognitive and behavioral psychologists that we'll talk about later on. So he really started to think about thinking and the psychology of as if. So he said that people form these beliefs to help understand, predict, and control their experiences. And similar to what we were just talking about, it matters if you believe in it, not anybody else. Um, and he would use this in therapy. And this is something, again, that's translated to modern like, cognitive behavioral therapies, where we tell clients to act as if, go act as if you're not depressed. What would that look like? 
Uh, we sometimes call this fake till you make it, right? Uh, and actually, there's a lot of really interesting science behind this that um, if you are depressed and you go out and act as if you're not depressed, you go out and actually like engage with people and do activities you enjoy, kind of force yourself to do them at first, right? Just the act of doing that actually helps alleviate your symptoms of depression. So there is, you know, again, sometimes what we find is later on, even if these theorists themselves didn't do research, we find stuff to back them up. All right, so here is a brief clip of Adler. So recall it takes a hot minute to start, so there we go. The socially mistaken pattern is built up in the first four or five years. Mostly we find is reasons for it imperfect organs, or that the child had been pampered, or that we find hated children is among orphans, sometimes illegitimate children, ugly children, not wanted children, and so on. This pattern is fixed and can be changed only if we are able to convince this child about the mistakes or later in life. Therefore, we could eliminate the mistakes in this pattern, either in prevention, to educate the family how to educate children rightly, or we could make the school an instrument of the social progress to recognize the mistakes in their beginning and to accomplish more social interest among the pupils. Later in life, it is more difficult and it must be an individual treatment. How so again, I think everyone thought it was a great idea to do interviews outside when they didn't have really good microphones and clearly like, you end up with not the best quality for things, right? Um, but you get a little bit of a feel for what it looked like when he sounded like, which is what I'm trying to do with these clips and make them not just that these mysterious amorphous, they, they were people, right? They were people who were human and who were trying to figure out this stuff together. All right, the next folk we're gonna talk about is Eric Erickson, who we already mentioned when we were talking about Freud's stages. So Erickson uh, was more of a post Freudian than Adler. Uh, he was alive from 1902 to 1994. And he was trained by Anna, Anna Freud. Um, and so he came up with these stages of psychosocial development. And for him, each of Freud's stages uh, identifies a crisis. And the more successfully you resolve each crisis, the better adjusted you will be. The important side note with this is you'll see just looking at this that Freud's theories kind of stops here, right? Freud was like, once you get to adolescence, you're in the general stage, you're good to go. And Erickson said, no, we need to keep looking at development across the lifespan because people still run into these crises as they grow and develop throughout their lives. So this is one of the places where he broke with Freud, right? And so trust versus mistrust, that first year of life, the main question here, the main conflict is, will your caregivers be reliable? If you're a baby and you cry, you need your diaper changed, you need food, do your caregivers come to you and fix things? Or are they not able to because of work? Are they irresponsible so they're not taking adequate care of you? Freud and also Erickson argued that how that is resolved will influence your trust throughout the rest of your life. Uh, anana, autonomy <laughs> versus shame and doubt uh, is like one to two years. So Erickson said kids need to learn to explore their world. So it's bad if the parent is too smothering, the kids out like crawling away, or at this point they're probably walking a little bit, and the parents are like, no, 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 don't go far away, right? 
but then it's also bad if you're neglectful and you let your kid just go and like tumble down the steps, right? <laughs> like that's not good either. So that you need to find a nice uh, middle ground there where you're letting the kids start to explore, but also making sure they're safe. Initiative versus guilt. This matches up with that edible complex. And Erickson argued what we're doing here is looking at, can the child plan or do things on their own? Like dress themselves. If you make the kiddo feel guilty about their own choices, they won't function as well. So this is why you'll often see kiddos around this age, sort of preschool age, wearing stuff that doesn't really match, right? Because oftentimes parents are just happy they put clothes on in the morning uh, because it's a thing sometimes. Like my daughter right now will only wear dresses. I'm like, what about a shirt? What about a dress? <laughs> okay, fine. Um, Erickson though had a very positive outlook on this particular stage. And he said that if they end up feeling guilt, that's quickly compensated for by their sense of accomplishment in other areas. So again, here again, he's breaking from Freud. He's not all doom and gloom about the Oedipal complex. Then uh, matching with the latent stage is competence versus inferiority. Here is where you start to compare your self-worth to others, like in a classroom environment, you might be like, ooh, well, Billy's good at math, but I'm not. Um, but then maybe you go outside and you're like, well, I'm better at soccer than Billy. So ha ha, right? <laughs> you start to figure those things out. Um, and you start to recognize disparities in personal abilities relative to the other children. And then there's identity versus role confusion. Um, that's highlighted because this is often the stage that a lot of folks in college are still in. So uh, this is your teen years into your 20s. The idea here is questioning yourself. Who am I? How do I fit in? So I'm just starting to think about what am I gonna do with the rest of my life? All those questions. Then he argued that in your 20s to your early 40s, you have intimacy versus isolation. Who do I wanna marry? Do I wanna get married? Who do I wanna spend my life with? What am I gonna do with my life? Do I wanna have kids? Do I not wanna have kids? Do I just wanna have dogs? Right, things along those lines. Now, one interesting thing that obviously modern research has shown is that these two overlap often in people's lives, right? So a lot of folks who are teenage, early 20s are also thinking about issues of intimacy versus isolation. And in fact, depending on your culture or subculture, you may be married by the time that you would get to Erickson's technical intimacy versus isolation stage, right? Then he said middle age is generativity versus stagnation. So this is again, playing on the midlife crisis. You're measuring people's accomplishments and or failures, uh, your own accomplishments and or failures. Am I satisfied with what I'm doing or not? And stagnation is the feeling of not having done anything to help the next generation, according to Erickson. He was very much about, we should be bringing up the next generation behind us. And then sort of old age, 60s and up, he argued was integrity versus despair. And some people handle it very gracefully, whereas others can be bitter, unhappy, dissatisfied with what they accomplished or failed to accomplish within their lifetime. At this point, people reflect on their past and either conclude with satisfaction or despair. Now again, in Erickson's time, even into the nineties, I don't think that we were thinking about this time as a possible time of productivity, but I'm certain that you know, most of us in our lives know people who find new ways to be fulfilling by either switching jobs or finding stuff to do in retirement, right? Um, you know, I think of my grandfather who's about to turn 92. Uh, he, after he retired, became very active in volunteer work. He um, worked for disaster services for the Salvation Army and would like bring out coffee for firefighters when they were working like fires. 
Um, he became a chaplain for the firefighter department actually after sort of building relationships with them. Right. And so, I, I mean, certainly in integrity, but I don't think he was like looking back on his life at that point. He was at the point where he was like, well, how can I contribute? Right. So I think that that is happening a lot more for folks in retirement now. And also in retirement, people are using that time to travel. Um, she's before any of your time, but uh, Professor Payne was our social science, uh, social work professor before Professor Clayton. And when she retired, she went on one of the first trips to Cuba after it was reopened to US citizens. So, you know, people find ways to find really fulfilling things at this stage in their lives. All right, so here is a video of Erickson. One of the most valuable concepts emerging from psychological research is that of lifespan development. The idea that many aspects of human nature continue to develop throughout the entire life cycle. As we come to the end of our life, for example, there's what we call biological senescing, growing older physically, but also the possibility of psychological adolescing and developing psychologically to our full potential. Eric Erickson helped redirect developmental psychology toward the entire life cycle. His insights into the crises of identity came out of his own experiences as a newcomer to the United States. Because as an immigrant, I faced one of those very important redefinitions that a man has to make who lost his language, his, uh, all the, the references on the basis of which his, uh, his sensory and sensual impressions were based. When I came to Boston in 1933, psychoanalysis, that was, that was quite a new field. Freud presented a very, very important model of psychosexual development, pointing out that we have to understand uh, a good deal of man's later life in view of the way he was able to resolve conflicts in his very early life. And it certainly seems that Freud uh, did not pay an awful lot of attention beyond these first five years of life. But certainly it seems that you try to conceptualize these later periods as well as these earlier periods in somewhat more detail. But you have added what seems to be some character dimensions that you think evolve eventually to this early level. You talk about basic trust versus basic mistrust being related to this oral sensory level. Remember here that this is not just a matter of a simple shift of focus, that one is built on the other. Now, you undoubtedly remember that what Freud first was very much concerned with was to find the experiences in life in which he could find quantities of something. So to him, the origins and the transformations of sexual energy it was not a matter of, of preoccupation with sexuality, but it seemed to him the most likely area in which you could find quantities which arise out of the body chemistry and are translated into drives. And the, the main point is that um, we later on were concerned not just with the question of uh, what does orality contribute to sexuality. What we were interested in is what um, orality may contribute to the child's psychosocial development. In other words, the orality takes place in relationship to the mother who feeds and who reassures and who cuddles and keeps warm. What you learn first in life is to take in. But as you take in, and take in with your mouth, with your eyes, with your senses, so what seemed important was what contribution is that to psychosocial education. And there I felt that the first basic psychosocial attitude to be learned is that you can trust your mother, that she will come back and feed you. But mistrust is just as important. Mistrust is very, the ratio of trust and mistrust is our basic social attitude. We do this constantly. If we walk, if we enter somewhere, we have to differentiate now. Can we trust or mistrust? And we, mistrust meaning the recognition of danger, the anticipation of discomfort, and so on. So these two things, that these are two things, is very basic to the whole scheme. Yeah. Building on the foundation of Freud, you've introduced the important dimension of social development, as you call it, psychosocial development. Uh, it's filling in a little bit of a gap in Freud's work in the sense that he did not really develop this. Erickson identified eight stages. 
So again, we, uh, I just wanted you to hear his voice and you see what he sounded like. And what I really like about these clips is you see the earnestness, right? You see how much these folks believed in their own theories um, and that they thought that their theories would help people going forward, right? They weren't just sort of pulling these out willy nilly. They were all really aiming to help people improve their lives. Alrighty, so next we're gonna start talking about Karen Horney. Uh, I have a lot about her, so we'll probably uh, keep going with her on Wednesday. Um, so she was alive from 1885 to 1952, and she was one of the few women physicians at this time. It was very hard for women to get into medical school around the turn of the century. Um, and basically she only did because her family was very wealthy and the sort of impression is that her father paid off the med school for her to get in, but she could have gotten there on her own merit if they just accepted women. She was very intelligent. She was the first to challenge Freud, especially on about his psychosexual ideas. Um, she concluded that her patients had social and financial problems, not sexual problems. Um, so Freud believed that girls were inferior due to biology and that this lack of inferior, uh, lack of a phallus led them to penis envy. Um, and that led to all kinds of things like never fully developing a super ego. And Horney said, no, <laughs> girls are inferior to boys due to the culture, due to society, due to socialization, due to conceptualizations about what each gender could do. Clearly her personal experience played into this, right? She said that the phallus or the penis was just a symbol of social power. And that, that it was the lack of that social power that led to those feelings of inferiority, not actually lacking a penis. It's not penis envy. Instead, she argued women envy the freedom to pursue their own interests and ambitions. So she and her theories ended up being called feminine psychology, partially because she was the first to focus on the experiences of women, rather than just sort of being like, eh, the women do the same thing, right? <laughs> like a bunch of the psychoanalysts had been doing. Um, but I also sometimes think this was like, to try to discredit it. Like, oh, that's just the feminine psychology. Uh, but, you know, she sort of embraced that. Um, and so she came up with the idea of womb envy. Uh, she said, this is a compliment to penis envy. And she said that, you know, okay, if we're gonna see that women are jealous of men and boys for being able to have a penis, then men and boys would have jealousy toward the female capacity to bear and nurse children. Because not only does that include nurturance, which she argued everybody had a drive for, but also the ability to create love. Right? Like if we take like five steps sideways, as someone who's had a child myself, it still boggles my mind sometimes that like, I grew a person in me, right? And that like people with uteruses do this all the time, right? It's sort of remarkable, right? And so when I fully acknowledge that's remarkable and people without uteruses, typically men don't have that ability and that that might be something they would envy. And she argued that you can see men's response to this indirectly throughout history and various forms of society. So rituals, taboos, uh, cleansings, witchcraft, denying women equal rights. She argued all of these were sort of a response to the recognition that women are actually pretty powerful because they're the ones who can create life. Um, it's very much influential, these ideas on modern ideas like The Handmaid's Tale, right? Um, and we can unfortunately see it in a lot of social ideas going on in our society right now. Um, the idea that Roe versus Wade has been rolled back, right? 
uh, even if you've never get an abortion yourself, the fact that now we are denying women who need it as a life-saving procedure in some cases uh, because the hospital is afraid of getting sued by the government is really problematic, right? Um, and my favorite is the people who've enacted these laws acting shocked when stuff like that happens. Like, oh, we never thought if we outlawed abortion, then like people couldn't get ectopic pregnancies taken care of. It's like, yeah, for a lot of conditions, abortion is the treatment, right? Anyway, that's a side note. Um, but you can just sort of see how her ideas permeate and then also can be recognized. And uh, she argued that men end up expressing their creativity externally because they cannot create life. And then that was one of the reasons why they kept women out of the places they could express their creativity, whether that would be as artists, as scientists, what have you, is because men were like, well, we have this at least, essentially. Part and I also talked about this idea of an acquired, excuse me, acquired sense of inferiority. She said, it's not like Adler, you aren't born feeling inferior. You acquire this through culture telling you this every day, right? And she said that women would respond with what some people termed a flight from womenhood. This is an idea in the 1920s. Um, people would be like, oh, women are so frigid now. Uh, frigidity is just a way to describe women who uh, don't want to acquiesce to society's romantic and sexual standards. Um, you know, and that was seen as cultural, not a normal attitude. Uh, women wishing they were men. And again, Horne argued they don't actually want to be men. They want the freedoms that men have. And she said that women will then end up with a fear of success because they fear that they will lose friends if they do succeed. And again, I think we see some of that in modern society still, how not all, but a lot of women will sort of be very humble, not talk things up, um, you know, uh, not be, be afraid to get promoted or if they get promoted, um, be worried about how others will see them. All right, I have just a brief video about Hornet. I couldn't find an interview with her. Which uh, of course, not everyone was on board with Freud's model of personality development. Many of his ideas were controversial and remain so to this day. Even most modern psychoanalysts now dispute the whole edible thing. In fact, while many pioneering psychoanalysts built on Freud's theories, these are so-called neo-Freudians, many disagree with lots of his ideas and instead either emphasize the role of the conscious mind or focus on non-sexual motivations. Take Karen Horney, for instance, a German-born psychoanalyst credited with founding feminist psychology. She wasn't down with the idea that our personalities are primarily shaped by sex and aggression. She especially rejected the notion of penis envy, which she thought was more than a little insulting to women. She actually proposed that womb envy may occur as much in men who are envious they can't give birth. She encouraged patients to take charge of their own mental health and engage in self-help and analysis, believing people were often able to sort of be their own therapist. Yeah, so she would do therapy herself. Then she also tried to empower her clients to help themselves, um, which again is a big part of a lot of modern therapies as well. All right, so we'll pick up. We're talking more about four and I on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we'll do the discussion that's scheduled Wednesday. And then we'll go back to normal, normally scheduled syllabus at that point in time. All right, have a good day, Zoom folks.